26, 12 through 20. And you're invited to turn there or follow along on the screen. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And, and so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that two unchangeable things that by two unchangeable things in which in which is impossible which is impossible for God to lie we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged we have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forebearer Jesus has entered on, be, on our behalf, he's become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Okay, this is God's word. Thank you, Kelly. Now, I'm going to uh, take a chance here by uh, moving from the sublime to the ridiculous. You just read uh, the word of God, and now you're going to read the word of Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> but I just had to go here. Well, she would call herself God. I probably shouldn't have said that. Anyway, check out this quote as we begin from Shirley MacLaine. It's actually a very good quote. She says, it's useless to hold a person to anything he says while he's one in love, two, drunk, or three, running for office. Is that not true? I mean, we say all kinds of things that we probably shouldn't say when we're in love. And, and definitely, if you're drunk, you're going to say things that are not accurate or not true, and you have no way to follow through because you don't even remember you said them. Or if you're running for office, and uh, since we are in an election cycle here, we can certainly relate to that. Promises, promises, promises. We are all familiar with broken promises, having been on the receiving end of a few of them throughout our lives. And frankly, if we're introspective enough, we realize that we have been guilty of breaking promises ourselves, so we have no right to cast stones at other people. But we are not very good at keeping our promises. What is a broken promise? A promise is when you say you're going to do something. It's a broken promise when you say you're going to do it, but then you do not do it. Or conversely, it's a broken promise when you say you will not do something, and lo and behold, you turn around and do it. Which one of you has not been guilty? We have all been guilty. Now, one of the most notorious broken promises that comes right to the surface as I try to search for an example in my life, again, special sense it's an election cycle, is this. Who does not remember these words? Read my lips. Finish it. No new taxes. Okay, poor George. He has never been able to live that one down. And I could have, I could have chosen from myriads of such broken promises in uh, the political process, but that one looms large. It's right in the forefront of my mind. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that all promise outruns performance. What does that mean? It means that it's a lot easier to promise than it is to fulfill. And that you promise all the time, but it's very likely that you fail to fulfill. When I was a kid, and I bet you uh, many of you guys can relate to this, when I was a kid, we knew this instinctively. We knew that it's a lot easier to say something than it is for it to actually be legit. And so what we would do when we wanted somebody to believe us, to really believe what we were saying, we would say something like this, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eyes, a way of taking an oath, somebody getting you, taking you seriously. And if that one wasn't used, then it was, I swear on a stack of Bibles. Right? You recognize that? Or, or the granddaddy of them all, I swear on my mother's grave. I don't know what that has to do with that. All of our mothers were still alive. 
Nonetheless, we were trying to heighten the weight of what we were saying. Traditionally, our country, in the court system, when somebody is going to be a witness in, in a court case, what do they do? They swear them in. You're sworn in. And I don't know how it goes anymore, but it used to be that you would put, what is it, your left hand on a Bible and your right hand in the air, or was it vice versa? I have to go back and watch Andy Griffith again, because that's when it used to happen that way, okay? And then you would, you'd be asked to, to, to swear this oath. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, not but the truth, so help me God? Remember that? Okay? Well, it's just been a part of, of, of the fabric of the country. This, this oath-taking, the need to, you know, what I'm going to say is true. So why do we feel so desperate to enhance the weight of our words as though the weight of our words wasn't sufficient in itself? Why the need to do this? And I was wondering... Could it be that it's compensation for some deficiency that we know exists in our words? The words are not heavy enough as it is because we're not people of our word, and so we feel the need to up the ante. Interestingly enough, in ancient Jewish culture, the culture in which the Bible came to be, the culture through which God spoke when he gave us the Bible, this kind of oath-taking was, uh, was, was beyond all proportion. It was just a way of life. There was a finely crafted art form of taking oaths. Interestingly enough, there was an elaborate system of oaths that had evolved that ranged from, one, the kind of an oath that was hardly binding at all, to the kind of an oath that was moderately binding, to the kind of an oath that was actually rock-solid and stable. And a wise, crafty person knew how to work that. So they would just say the right thing at the right time so that they never were really culpable for not keeping that word. Well, I didn't, put, I didn't say it with this kind of an oath. It was only this kind of an oath. And they would play it. And so you were never, never bound to keeping your word. And this was such an issue in Jesus' day, in the, in the era of the New Testament that New Testament writers like James had to tackle it straight on. Do you remember what James had to say about oaths to the Christians in the first century? He said, guys, knock it off with the oath-taking already, would you? Just be honest people. Let your yes mean yes. Let your no mean no. And anything beyond that is wrong. Stop it. Be trustworthy people. Mean what you say and say what you mean. This is what James had to say to people living in that world. Now, have you ever noticed that this compulsion to take oaths or to swear by something greater than yourself, have you ever noticed that it actually works almost in reverse? Let me explain what I mean. Think about it. If you have to say to me, if you have to say to me, I mean it, I swear. It makes me wonder why you're having to go, such, go to such lengths to get me to believe you. Why can't I just hear what you say? It actually works somewhat in reverse. And it lessens over time the weight that your words carry. There was a Greek dramatist in the 500s BC who hit on this. And, and his name was Aeschylus. And he wrote this. It is not the oath that makes us believe the man. But it's the man that makes us believe the oath. In other words, your character speaks louder than what you promise. And if you are a person of character, you need no oath. Everybody trusts you. If you're not, it doesn't matter what oaths you take. It just waters it down. It just you know, it takes the weight away. Now, why are we talking about all this? Well, because promises and oaths are at issue in the passage that we just read together. And these are promises and oaths made by God himself. Let's look at Hebrews 6, 12. And this is the verse that Kelly began with. She read, we don't want you to become lazy, you Christ followers, you. We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. And then he goes off on this thing about promises and oaths. And, and if, you're a, if you're an engaged reader, you're probably already asking yourself, what was promised? By whom? To whom? You've got to be asking those questions or you're not seriously reading. 
Okay, so who promised what to who? Well, simply put, the short answer is these are promises that have been made by God to his children. We who are his children through faith in Christ. Now, most recently in the book of Hebrews, at least the one that rose to the fore of my mind as I taught, so what promises have we already seen in Hebrews? My mind went back to this one. There is a promised Sabbath rest for those who are the children of God, for the people of God. God promised a rest, meaning a place of no longer striving, but resting and receiving with sound mind and peace between you and God because of Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. This was promised to us most recently in Hebrews. Now, in order to get his readers to begin engaging on the idea of a promise-keeping God, what does he then do? Well, he brings up ancient Jewish history. Why would he do that? Because these were Jewish background believers, Christ followers, who were raised as Jewish people. And they never stopped being Jewish. They became Jewish people who trusted Jesus and followed him. And so he brings up their own history to them, which everyone who read this would have known what he's talking about. He brings up promises made by God to a man named Abraham. Abraham, the progenitor of Jewishness, who had lived 2,000 years before the writing of the letter that we're engaging this morning. Now, he quotes a line from Genesis chapter 22, and it's just a line. Here's what he says, and this is verses 13 and 14 from Hebrews. It's a quotation of Genesis. Here's what he says. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by. Now, that's actually a funny thought. Where do you go when you're God? How do you appeal to something higher than you? So, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, Abraham, and give you many descendants. Now, as I said, that's not a complete rendering. It's only a partial allusion to something that was written in Genesis chapter 22. And I wanted to talk about this this morning because this is important. So I want you to actually see a little bit more of the context where God is making this promise and swearing by himself to this man named Abraham. Okay, this is Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 through 18. Engage this with me if you would. Now, the angel of the Lord Yahweh, pause, I remind you, and I've told you this before, whenever in the Old Testament you see this description, the angel of Yahweh, that's the word Lord in all capitals, most scholars believe this is a reference to Jesus before the first Christmas. Jesus, who always existed as God, but at a point in time, took upon himself humanness. He never left behind the godness. He just added to it humanness. And the Old Testament speaks of this character, this the angel of Yahweh. And it's always as though God himself is speaking. People bow down to the angel of Yahweh in the Old Testament. So I believe that this is Jesus Christ before he ever became a human being. Talking here. Now listen, listen to the passage. The angel of the Lord Yahweh called to Abraham from, from heaven a second time. In other words, this isn't the first time that God has promised something to Abraham. He's renewing it here. Here's what he says. He said, I swear by myself, declares Yahweh. Now, wait a minute. Is it the angel of Yahweh or is it Yahweh? See what I mean? It's the same. I swear by myself, declares Yahweh, that because you have done this, Abraham, and not withheld your son, your only son, in other words, Abraham was willing to let go of the life of his son that God had promised to him. He was willing to let it go if it meant obedience to God. Since you've been willing to do this, verse 17, God says, Abraham, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants, Abe, will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, Abraham, all nations on the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now, that is a loaded promise. The writer of the book of Hebrews then 
cites that promise made by God to Abraham and then adds these words. Hebrews 6.15 And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Now, can I just be a little bit honest with you here? Okay, that is true, but it's like so under-treating the promise. Of course, it wasn't the writer's goal to go into great depth about all that Abraham went through to be faithful to God's promise and how God brought his promise about in his life. His point was simply to show you an example of how it is to be trusted that God will do what he says. He always has and he always will. And that's the main point of the writer of Hebrews here. But that's too simple for me. It's too simplistic. I was thinking to myself, this is deeper. We've got to pull back the layers on this for a minute. All right? Rather than just skimming the surface, I want you to look at what God promised to Abraham and what Abraham had to go through as he waited for God's promise. Okay, you track it with me? Okay, here's what was promised to Abraham. If we break down Genesis 22, 15 through 18 a little bit more. What was promised here? First of all, countless offspring were promised to Abraham. And it was said in these words. Abraham, you'll have descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Okay, you ever tried to count the stars? Even more so. Can you imagine trying to count grains of sand on the seashore? The point was, Abraham, your posterity will be so numerous it is uncountable. That's what God promised to this man. Secondly, God promised to this man that there would be a place for this innumerable horde of people that would come from his loins, to use King James language. They will have a place. How did he say it to them? To Abraham, he said, your descendants, Abe, will take possession of the cities of their enemies. I'm going to drive them out, and your descendants are going to fill the land. And then the third thing he promises, beyond offspring, beyond a place for those offspring, he promises this obscure idea of blessing. Abraham, you are going to be a blessing to all people on the globe through your offspring, Abe. That's what I'm promising you. And he put it in these words, through your offspring, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, before we look a little bit further, I just want to make a statement. The fulfillment of God's promises, guys, does not usually look the way we would expect it to look. Nor does it follow the course that we would expect it to take. Let me tell you why I say this. Here's Abe's experience with the fulfillment of of God's promises to him. Number one, Abraham waited 25 years for the promised offspring. Okay, think about that. And, and you know, and I, I often go to this. I mean, we struggle to wait for anything from God. It's who we are. Well, God made a promise to Abraham, nothing for 25 years. Now, if it were merely 25 years, I would say, okay, well, that's not even that big of a deal. Get this. Abraham and his wife during the passing of these 25 years, became well past the season when he and his wife could expect to have children. The King James says it this way about Abraham's wife, Sarah. It was no longer with her after the way of women. In other words, it was not physically possible for Sarah to conceive any longer. Those days, that ship had sailed. Now, wrestle with this. You're a 75-year-old man and 25 years are going to pass after God has promised you're going to have a child. And things don't work the way they used to work. And you're getting really old. And yet God has promised you. You think there's not going to be some sort of a struggle between Abraham and God? How does this work? Please explain this to me. Do you understand what Abraham had to work through for 25 years? See, the way God delivers his promises to you doesn't mean you're not going to have to labor. Doesn't mean you're not going to have to figure out how you're going to work what trusting God looks like when things no longer even look possible. This is not for the faint of heart. Secondly, 
Abraham at his death, which it came about at 175 years of age, believe it or not. They lived a long time in those days. As an old man, at 175 years old, he died while owning nothing more of the land that God had promised him than a single burial plot. It was, it was a cave called Machpelah. That's all he owned in that land. And yet God had promised him that he would have these offspring that would outnumber the sands and the seashore and they would have a place. Well, he's got nothing but a burial plot. Now, get, get this in your mind. Abraham was promised by God when he, was a, when he was 75. He died at 175, 100 years, and he's got nothing more than a burial plot. Are you seeing my point? It is difficult to work through these things, what it looks like to believe what God has said, when nothing in your life seems to substantiate it. Got it? But that's the work of faith. Thirdly, Abraham died having no understanding, I believe, of how in the world he and his progeny could ever be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. That had to be a baffling mystery to him. Because we know in hindsight this had to do with the descendant of, uh, the descendant of Abraham, a Jewish man who was born whose name was Jesus. Abraham did not meet Jesus, not in the flesh. He died having wondered what in the world, and yet he believed God was going to be faithful to his promises. So my conclusions about all of this are these, just three of them anyway. One, God's promises don't guarantee prompt delivery, at least the way we would define prompt. Okay, so get over that one. Second of all, God's promises must be embraced even though there is very little to indicate that they are actually even being remembered by him. Can you track with that? That's an important one. There may be no indicators in your life that God even remembers having made a promise, but you've got to hang on to it anyway. Thirdly, you and I must trust God to bring to fruition his own promises in ways that fit his intentions, not your mistaken notions of what his intentions are. When God tells Abraham, I'm going to make you a blessing to all the peoples of the earth, Abraham could have decided, well, that means I'm going to be a great king. Would that have been accurate? No. See, in other words, that wasn't God's way of making him a blessing to the world. But you and I have to be careful to hold those kinds of actual applications loosely. Now then. With all of that having been said about the promise-keeping God, let's go back and try to make sense of Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. Here's what it says. We do not want you to become lazy. Well, that makes sense now, doesn't it? But to imitate those who through faith and patience. Another word for patience is long perseverance. <laughs> Who, th who imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Now, move ahead to verse 16. This is Hebrews 6, 16. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Okay. Now, we've already talked about that, how we try to up the ante by appealing to someone who's greater and bigger and more powerful than we are when we swear on so-and-so or swear by so-and-so. I don't know how many times a week I hear somebody say, I swear to God, you know, this is what we're trying to do. Okay, we already talked about that. So let's move ahead, verse 17 and 18. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things, not one, but two, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. Think about that last line for a minute. What caused God to take an oath that he would keep his promise? His desire to encourage us who struggle to hold on by faith. This is like God dumbing himself down 
to talk to a bunch of elementary students. Okay? If you were going to talk to a classroom of children, you would probably bring it down a little bit. What do they say? Put the cookies on a lower shelf? This is God doing that when he takes an oath that he will keep his word. How kind of God. How thoughtful. Knowing this tendency in us to need to be reassured, God chose to back up his promise with an oath. Sheer kindness. Hmm. So, God initially made some promises. And then second of all, he took an oath that he would keep his promises. Now, what's interesting here is this. At least this is interesting to me. Nowhere in this passage of Hebrews does it show us God actually making this oath. It just talks about the fact that God made an oath. And interestingly enough, a lot of scholars, and I would, I would count myself among this number, although I'm not a scholar, but I, I agree with the, the position. I think the oath that God takes here is the giving of the Holy Spirit to those who decide to give their lives to Jesus Christ. Now, let me just explain this to you. The Bible promises to anyone who says to Jesus Christ, I am a sinner, I need your forgiveness, and I want you to lead my life. The Bible promises to that person the gift of the Holy Spirit. Very, very simple. And do you know what language the Bible uses to describe the Holy Spirit? The Bible speaks of the giving of the Holy Spirit to you as a Christ follower as though it were a guarantee. The word guarantee is used. A down payment. A first installment of your inheritance. God gives you the Holy Spirit as this deposit, this, this, this guarantee, this promise. So I can very well conclude that the oath that God gives us is his own spirit to engage us intimately as Christ followers as we go through life. And I think that's beautiful. It's fantastic. Now, here's what I did next throughout this last week. I, I was thinking to myself, okay, so God has made promises to me, and he has affirmed with an oath that he will keep his promises, two things by which it's impossible for God to lie. All right, so Jay, what promises of God that he has sworn he will keep to you can you recall? What promises come to mind right now? Put you on the spot. So I did that with myself, and five of them just came flooding to my mind. Boom. I didn't spend any time on this at all. And I thought, oh, my goodness, these are precious. These are beautiful. And you could probably come up with your own five just like that, too. But let me show you the five that just came flooding to my mind immediately. One, here, this, came, this comes from the book of Isaiah. Here's the promise. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Oh, God promises, and he swears on oath that he will keep the promise. And I immediately thought of white carpet and a glass of red wine. <sighs> My sins feel that way. My sins feel like that stained, like that ain't coming out. But God says, Jay, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. God has promised it. Guys, maybe you need to believe that today. Another one came flooding to my mind is this promise. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and follows into verse 2. All right, let, let's put that another way. Because you are in Jesus Christ, and I want you to picture yourself wrapped up in a white sheet, and the white sheet that's wrapping you is Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because you are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore no condemnation, which basically means God will never stand before you and point the figure and say, you go to hell. You are damned. That will never happen to you because you are in Christ. Now, is that pressure? God has promised it, and he's sworn on oath that he'll keep the promise. A third one that came to my mind. Whoever comes to me, says Jesus, I will in no wise cast out. Guys, I don't care who you are. I don't know the mess that your life is. Probably only different in shade, not in degree, than the mess that's my life. But I don't care who you are. 
Jesus says, you come to me, I will not kick you to the curb. I promise. A fourth one that came to my mind, and again, the words of Jesus, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. Listen to these words. I give them what? And they will never what? Mark my words. No one can snatch them out of my hand. God promises, and he swears an oath that he will deliver on the promise. And a last one from Hebrews. I had to go one from Hebrews. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Are you the people of God? What remains for you? A Sabbath rest. Mm. Now, look at verse 18 again from a little bit different angle this time. We just go hold that gemstone up a little bit so the light catches it a little bit more different, a little bit differently. God did this, what? He swore a promise. He made a promise and then swore on an oath to keep the promise. He did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. And at last down to that phrase, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us, we who have fled, fled, that word struck me. And I got these images in my mind. You mean fleeing is like one would flee from a burning building? Yeah. Yeah, can you imagine being on the 10th the floor of a building that's on fire and you're trying to get out? Yeah. Yes, I'm fleeing out of the burning building to Jesus. We who have fled, fleeing as to the offer of certain healing to a person who's deathly ill and has spent all their money on doctors, and yet a cure has been evasive, and now somebody's telling you there's a miracle cure. You think you're going to flee to that one? Yeah. Fleeing as like to an offer of a free home in the mountains and a promised monthly stipend of $10,000 per month? Yeah. Who's not going to run to that one? We who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us. That's what we're doing with Jesus. I love the phrase, I am fleeing to Jesus, my refuge, my shelter, the one who's promised me a mansion forever. <laughs> yeah, you bet I'm fleeing. Now, there's a beautiful image or two in this passage that we have yet to speak of, and this will form the rest of what we're going to do here this morning. Some of my greatest memories, and I was talking with Brennan before the service began about some of the flooding in West Virginia. There's a great river down in this part of West Virginia called the Greenbrier River. Some of my greatest memories uh, uh, involve uh, obviously marrying this wonderful woman over here, but I married into her family, and um, her grandparents both lived in this tiny West Virginia town on the Greenbrier River, which I think is probably flooded. Um, but when it's not flooded, it's a beautiful river. It's not threatening anybody at that time. Some of my greatest memories are fishing on that river with one of her grandfathers. Just great memories. And one of the things I experienced fishing on that river and a whole bunch of other rivers since is uh, the, the need for an anchor. You're just in a little John boat with oars, you know. It's not fancy fishing, you know. You don't even need a motor. You're just rowing or in a canoe for that matter. An anchor is very helpful. Why? Because if there are certain, certain holes that look particularly fishable, it's hard to fish them when you're drifting by them. Or while you're rowing, you can't, you can't do it. So you need an anchor. You've got to throw an anchor because it's going to... And it's funny how it works, too. Because of the current of the river, you know, you can feel it hits the bottom and it's... <laughs> okay, man. It caught. It caught. Okay, that's what you use the anchor for, and that way you can work that hole for as long as you want. Pull as many fish out of there as you as, as want to cooperate. Okay, but there's a downside to the using the anchor. You got to pull it up, okay? And, uh, you know, we're not talking fancy fishing, so there's no little motor to wind up the line. And even if you do, sometimes there's a problem. That anchor wedges so well, it ain't coming back. Sometimes it works its way, because of the current pulling, it works its way under a large rock. And sometimes it helps if you, if you reverse the angle, if you row back up, okay, so you can pull it up this way, get it unwedged. Sometimes that helps. Sometimes nothing you do is going to unwedge that anchor. Now, 
folks, frankly, I would still be sitting on the river pulling at that anchor if I hadn't made the decision to just cut it off. Because there's no way you're getting it loose. I've had that happen many times in many different rivers. And I could get this image of this collection of old rusty anchors that are now piling up at the bottom of the river. Because other people have had the same problem. You just cut them off and leave them. They wedge so well. Now listen to these words from Hebrews 19 and keep that image in mind. We have this hope. What hope? The double promising God who takes an oath to keep his promise. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Firm and secure. And I realize, you know, life has currents which would subversively, subversively, little by little, loosen the grip of your anchor, the anchor of your faith. Not only does it have subversive currents, but life actually produces periodic violent storms that in one mighty blast would threaten to break your anchor free. And thirdly, there are actually unseen beings that hate your faith and hate you that would nibble and gnaw away at the line of your anchor and set you freely adrift again in the currents of the world. So my statement then would be, may our anchor of faith wedge that irretrievably into the absolute bedrock of Jesus our faithful and merciful high priest. In the ancient Mediterranean world, every harbor was endowed with what was called an ancoria. Now, if you look at the word on the screen, you'll see the word anchor in it. Now you know where it comes from. This is just one form of the word that we translate as anchor. Every ancient Mediterranean harbor had an ancoria. The Ancoria was simply an enormous stone immovably embedded in the ground near the water's edge. And the immense stone was used as a mooring point for any sailing vessel that would come into the harbor. It all it had to do was tie up there to the immense stone, the Ancoria of the harbor. But sometimes weather conditions were adverse. The winds and the storms were strong and it was impossible for a, a ship under power of the wind to get in there and reach the Ancoria. It was just not humanly possible. So what would they do? Get this. One member of the crew would get in a little dinghy, whatever you would call it back in the day, and row in the violent storm by himself with a line attached to him, row into the harbor against the wind through the storm, and he would personally affix the line from the ship to the Ancoria. And guess what this person was called? He was called a prodromos, a prodromos in Greek. You can see the word pro there, which means before. And dromos is simply one who goes, one who goes before. And in our English Bibles, we translate the word prodromos as forerunner, which I don't know actually, accurately enough expresses it. This forerunner actually goes beforehand and he attaches the line to the Ancoria. By the way, it's fair to say that the prodromoi, which is plural of prodromos, these were the bravest of the brave. They were willing to lay down their lives if need be for it to be safe for those on the ship. Now, why do I say this to you? With that image in mind, listen again, Hebrews 6, 19 through 20. We have this hope as an ancoria for the soul, firm and secure. It, that hope, enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our podromos, that's the word, where our podromos, our, our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. So in this passage, you have Jesus being pictured in two ways. He is pictured as the Ancoria himself. And he's pictured as the Prodromos. 
the one who goes before. He's the one who takes the risk and goes out in front to secure us to the mooring point. <laughs> so as we begin to conclude here, think about this. If we humans who struggle to keep our word, as Shirley MacLaine suggested, as Ralph Waldo Emerson suggested, if we struggle to keep our word and we try to strengthen the force of our words by appealing to oaths, then just imagine how much more powerful is an oath taken by God. This is what the author of Hebrews wants you to feel. And I want to give you a quote from Andrew Murray, early 1900s. Here's what he wrote. It's as if God asks us if we do not think his word enough. <laughs> if we think it possible that he, the faithful and the unchangeable one, should lie. He knows how little our darkened hearts trust him. His promises are so large, so divine, and so heavenly that we can't take them in. And so, to waken and to shame us out of our unbelief, he comes, and as, it were, as if it were possible for God to lie, he calls us to listen as he takes an oath in our presence that he will do what he has said. And it goes with this statement. The fullness of my faith depends upon my being occupied with the faithfulness of God. It's not about me. It's about him. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for giving us such a secure hope. Thank you for willing to con being willing to condescend and swear to us that you will keep your promises. Lord, if you are not a promise-keeping God, then we have no hope. But since you are a promise-keeping God, we have all hope. Everything rides on you, Lord. We hold to you. You are our anchor, dearest Jesus, in whose name I pray. Amen.